Today we are going to be building a vibration table for casting concrete or casting concrete without honeycombing. So in this video, I'm going to just basically cover a couple of different points, but this is this is a temporary table that I'm going to make. I'm going to make it adjustable such that I can make changes to it as needed. And the way that you build your vibration table will depend entirely on the type of products and projects that you're building. You know, if you need something very large, holding things that are three, four feet in diameter, you need an actual vibration table, a full-size table that vibrates. But I don't really need that. I need more like a bench top model, but bigger than the stuff that you might see for making like candle holders and things like that available on Amazon. So I'm going for that happy medium there. I'm not looking to spend a lot of money with this thing, just something quick and easy that I can throw together. And I think I've got a plan here that's going to work. Let's get started. We're going to be powered with two one quarter sheet palm sanders depending on the size of the table, the power that you need, the amperage of the motor. These are two amp motors, so they're pretty powerful. It'll definitely be enough for anything small, medium, probably even large size as well. Uh, right now, all I have done is I've drilled four corners in the sides and just put through four screws on each sander just to hold it to the board. Uh, put a little bit of this, uh, I don't know what this stuff's called, but it's uh, kind of like a traction mat. It's supposed to give you a little bit of traction that'll stop stuff from floating around just a little bit. Uh, and other than that, I just have like kind of an extra long board in this area in the middle, whether just sitting on here or I could expand this and make it larger into a larger surface area if I needed it. I don't. I want a bench top model here, something portable, something customizable. And I think that's what we've got started here. So that's that part. The base platform, just a smaller piece of wood that sticks out a little, little bit at the front so I can clamp it to my bench top here. On the rear side, I've made an adjustment just because my countertop is severely out of level. So I just added a couple of feet to the back side there. It's pretty good. I think even the piece of wood is maybe just a tiny bit warped, but for what I'm doing, this is going to be perfectly fine here. So now what do we do? We've got a base platform. We got the top. We got a power source that we're going to create this vibration with, but we're missing a very, very important element here. How are we going to attach the top to the bottom in such a way that we're going to have some spring tension? And there's a couple of different methods. I've seen some different ways that people do it, but here's a really easy, cheap and effective way to do it. That's actually going to allow you to customize your table to the exact degree that you need it to be done for, which is great because everybody building one of these probably got a pretty unique situation that they're working with. So here we have some die springs from a 3d printer. This one here is rated for a lot like, uh, 125 kilograms or something like that, or maybe even more. And I mean, there's some give there but not very much at all that's for sure these guys here the taller ones much better a lot less tension taller of a spring which is good i'll touch on that more in a second here and these come in all different lengths and strengths and stuff like that they're color coded and the best part is they cost a couple of dollars literally a couple of dollars you can get yourself a bag of these springs when whatever tension and uh, length that you need them i suggest picking up a couple because this table I could use for multiple different things. If I was going to do something lightweight and small, which is what I'm primarily using this for, I'm going to use like a softer spring. If I want to load this up with a 200 pound plant pot that I'm building or something like that, you're going to need something a lot stronger. So let's talk about how we're going to go about attaching these. What we need to do is figure out a way in which we can get these springs attached, but we're not sending hardware through. Like if I just send a screw right through, you know, the top piece of wood and into the spring into the bottom. Yeah, no, it's definitely in there, but the screw itself is transferring the force load and there's no give at all. There's no, you know, basically it'll work, like it'll vibrate like crazy, but it'll vibrate the whole work platform as opposed to primarily just the table, which is what we're aiming for here. So the way that I'm going to handle that, I'm going to send through some screws here. 
uh, through the bottom platform. So if you can picture, this screw's gonna be coming up through that hole right there with a little bit showing through, and I'm just gonna set the spring on top of that. That's how this is going to be connected on the bottom side. So let's just go ahead and get started with that here. So this is kind of the idea there. And we're gonna do a similar thing from the top, but just a little bit different. Okay, for the top mounting of the springs here, what I'm going for is not just something like the bottom where it kind of slides on easily. I found something with like a longer aggressive thread. I want it to actually hold that, that screw. It's gonna make it a lot easier so it's not constantly falling all over the place here. I've got some pilot's hold drilled so I should be able to just send this through. good to me. Sounds like it's going to make a, an awful racket so I'm going to go ahead and put some hearing protection on and then we'll give it a test spin here. Caught that one just in time. You know what I'm going to do? Let's improve that. Because this is wood, Gonna go ahead and make a slight adjustment. Okay, so we'll go ahead and let that glue set up, and that'll help the screws to hold in there, kind of like a little bit of Loctite. The wood will bind really well with the glue, and it should enhance that grip a little bit better. Uh, surprisingly, the flange didn't break, just the screws let go. There wasn't quite enough meat holding on there for that level of vibration, but that level of vibration is exactly what we're going for here. I'm gonna let that set up. I'm gonna go cool off for a minute, then I'm gonna come back, mix up some concrete, and let's try this thing out. Okay, I'm putting the mix together, but before I do, I wanna make just a couple more last minute alterations here. So the first thing I'm going to do, maybe just tap these off, just so they're not deadly sharp. Next thing I'm gonna do, so I'm gonna give them a little wrap, some electrical tape here. I think this is gonna help with the, a little bit with the noise and the fit. added the, the glue to help hold those screws in. Good idea. But I think it's going to take more than that. It failed so quickly, I think that I'm going to add a little support from the bottom here. That's a lot quieter. I bet you that's gonna work a lot better. Okay, so I'm gonna let that other uh, two screws set up for a little bit, let that glue dry, finish up the mix, and we'll go ahead and try and vibrate our first concrete casting. I've got my mix right here, two parts white sand to one part white cement. So let's go ahead and get it in the mold here. Now, I'm not going to use a slurry here. Normally, I would use a slurry when I'm casting and just Portland cement and water mixed to cake batter, pancake batter consistency. Paste it in with a, a paintbrush and really get it into all the nooks and crannies, and that will help you to get a very detailed, defined finish with your casting that should be free of voids or honeycombing. I'm not going to do any of that. We're going to go easy mode here. It's going to take this white plaster material, go ahead and shovel it in here. Use a little bit of force to apply it. I have a universal release agent applied to this polyurethane skin, so you want to just kind of work it around a little bit physically. And now we'll go ahead and drop some more in here. I don't want to fill this to the top, because as I vibrate it, I'm going to be raising water to the surface. And I want to have some room left over to be able to add some more material on top, and I also just don't want it overflowing all over the place. So let's go ahead and try out the vibration table.
right before we turn this thing on, let's talk about this for just one second here. I don't need both. I need, really, I don't even need one because this is a very small piece I'm making. I've got light duty springs on here. I want this to be versatile enough that I can use small, medium, or large casting on here. But right now for this little thing, I think it's going to be overkill if I try to use both of them. Uh, they're going to be fighting against each other unnecessarily. I'll get tons of vibration out of just one. There could be a better option if you're willing to spend more money on your table. I kind of was taking the approach I wanted to make this thing for as cheap as possible. I think I'm in for under 50 bucks and it's pretty useful. Uh, and that's Canadian money too. Uh, so I don't know, $40 US in and about. If I was willing to spend more, I could have bought one or two variable speed grinders instead of these bottom of the barrel, uh, cheap, no-name ones. And these ones will just have one speed, it'll be super fast, it'll be really loud, definitely vibrate this a lot, which is what we want ultimately. But the thing is, is that if you were to have a rheostatic control, variable speed, it would enable you to do something very, very specific. Everything in our world and universe is made out of waves and that's, you know, sound waves or water or gamma or everything. Every last thing is based on waves and everything has an, a frequency, an internal frequency. Take a glass of water, put it on a piano and walk up the keyboard and one of those notes will make the water vibrate. That is called resonant frequency. That's also the reason why, you know, troops marching in step will march out of step as they cross bridges to avoid finding the resonant frequency of that particular bridge and destroying it in the process. If you have the ability to control the speed on the vibration source, you could dial it in until you find the resonant frequency of whatever it is that you're making. And you're like, how would I know? You will be able to hear it. As you tune it, the way that it's shaking will minimize, but the amount of air that you'll see escaping will be maximized. So it's it's something that you, you would hear acoustically. It's not something that you could measure or anything like that. And certainly with one speed, I'm not going to have that ability. If you want to spend more, get a variable speed control palm sander, and that's going to allow you to dial in the amount of vibration that you have. I don't have that. I got the cheap ones. It's going to be loud. It's going to be very vibrate -y. Let's see how this works. I want to let this thing go for a couple of minutes. In theory, you shouldn't do that. If you vibrate too much, you're going to consolidate all the material to the bottom and all the water to the top, and that would compromise the strength greatly. You would never do such a thing for a structural application like a bridge or a foundation for your home or something like that. For ornamental cast concrete, we can be a little bit more lenient. Yes, we're consolidating a lot of the uh, physical aggregates to the bottom, but this isn't a structural happy face, it's just a decorative happy face. So it'll still be okay if we vibrate it a little bit extra long because I want all of that air to the surface. So I'm more or less gonna let it run until I see the air stop coming to the surface. Go ahead and just set that aside, let it cure, and we'll see how well that worked out. Well, we had another failure of the mounting method for my drill here. It rattled my screws right out, so I'm just going to replace those. I'll put some, uh, some bolts through it washer and a nut from the backside, and until the flange physically breaks on it, that'll stop it from coming off of there. It's kind of a tall ask. When stuff reaches, you can hear it. I'm, I, I'm going to turn down the volume because that's very loud, but you'll hear the resonant frequencies happening, right? Like the things buzzing around and jumping, and then all of a sudden it, it starts to sound like it's all in harmony together, and that's exactly what's happening. And that's very, very difficult on mechanical components like this. But I'll just do a better job mounting it on there, and it should, you know, more or less resolve that from happening, unless it were to break the flange completely, in which case I guess you could just take some copper strapping and go right over the top, something like that. Okay, we're back, and I've got some better hardware to fix up a problem there. So what I have here is just some bolts with a fender washer on one end, and then a split lock washer on the other end and that should help to deal with the vibrations here it was kind of wishful thinking that a wood screw was going to hold that in there 
but we gave it a try, it didn't work. Let's go ahead and fix that up. That should be a lot more effective at resisting those vibrations. Well, it's still loud as heck, but definitely works really well if you're looking to vibrate some concrete. Check these a little bit later and make sure that they stay tight. That should just be regular maintenance. That's why I got bolts that are a little bit longer, so it's not just going to let go and break off suddenly, you'll notice that the washers start to get loose and then you can tighten it up again. Those lock washers work really well, but they're not a silver bullet against like a worst case scenario of vibration, which a vibration table is, especially a really cheap one that we're just throwing together like this. So I think that's pretty effective. I'm really happy with how that turned out. It's pretty versatile. It's a bench top unit, but you can use small, medium or large size pieces on it, depending on the setup that you use. It's certainly got plenty of power with the one a uh, quarter sheet palm sander. You don't need to unless you're doing something really big. And if you do a lot of this stuff, I recommend investing into the variable speed palm sander because it's a little bit less like crazy out of control vibration and something that, you know, I could probably do with a lot less power even than just one of them for a lot of the small bench top stuff that I'm doing. Let's go ahead and demold this. When I poured this, I didn't use a slurry, which is something I would recommend to do if you want honeycombing or void-free castings. I kind of gave this a worst case scenario. This isn't even a modified cement product, it's just white sand and white cement. It's not non-shrink grout or cementol or any of those really forgiving, more expensive mix designs. Just sand and cement, no slurry layer. This thing should be chock full of pock marks and holes. But let's see how much our vi vibration table was able to help us. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty good. I mean, there might be like some tiny defects, even like tiny, tiny. This is 99% consolidated, which is fantastic for no slurry or anything like that. Let me show you another example. So here's kind of what I would normally expect, even with manual vibrating, but nothing as aggressive as the vibration table. That's about the difference that you can uh, expect in terms of results. And as you can see, it's a very significant difference. And again, this is all just done using the lowest cost mix designs, just sand and cement, nothing fancy at all. I hope you found this information helpful.